book passage this evening and supporting your local independent bookstore. We're very happy to have you here. Thank you for checking your cell phones. Those are off. My name is Monica Golden, and I will be hosting this evening's event for you. Book Passage is honored to welcome journalist, author, and staff writer for The New Yorker, William Finnegan. His newest book is titled Barbarian Days, A Surfing Life. Finnegan's memoir is about the beautiful addiction of surfing and his wave-chasing adventures that have taken him around the world. Barbarian Days is an old-school adventure story and an intellectual autobiography about the mastering of an understated art. Today, Barbarian Days debuted at number five on the New York Times Best Seller list. So please give a very warm welcome to William Finnegan. Uh, thank you all very much. I was pleased with that news too. <laughs> um, uh, really, thanks for coming out on a, on a day we never see in New York. Beautiful summer day. It's like 100 degrees there at the moment. Um, and muggier than imaginable. Um, I've um, actually spent um, most of my so called career um, writing about politics very broadly defined um, you know, about conflict, power, and injustice, mainly in the developing world. Um, in fact, I was titillated to hear that Don Winslow, I think you know him, he's, he's sort of the great fiction writer of Mexican cartels, um, was here. Um, he, I've been reporting on organized crime in Mexico uh, the last few years. Um, that's the kind of stuff I normally do. Um, this book is much closer to home. Um, A.J. Liebling, I don't know if anybody reads him anymore, but uh, he's a wonderful writer, once wrote an essay um, called Apology for Breathing, um, in which he pretended to apologize for being from New York, uh, <laughs> a city that he actually loved you know, lavishly and, and precisely. Um, um, Liebling wrote, People I know in New York are incessantly on the point of going back where they came from to write a book, or of staying on and writing a book about back where they came from. <laughs> At some point I realized that I've become one of those New Yorkers, uh, incessantly on the point of going back where I came from. Uh, but with me it's not a matter of, of packing up or staying on, but rather being always sort of half poised to, to flee my desk and, and ditch engagements in order to uh, throw myself into some nearby patch of ocean at the moment when the waves and wind and, and the tide might conspire to produce something rideable. Um, it, there are quite good waves around New York, oddly enough, a lot of them don't know that. Um, and that, that sort of cracking fugitive patch is where I come from. And this is a book uh, about that myth-encrusted place. Um, actually, I keep hearing from people who, who've read the book um, or read advanced copies. Um, it's not about surfing, which I love to hear. Um, you know, they say it's, it's, it's about men or love or obsession, how to live. They say I love to hear all this. Um, had one reviewer just um, compared it at some length to Middlemarch. No. Um, I mean, great company, but um, uh, well, it's a New York review of books, what do you expect? Um, I was trying to write about a lot of things, uh, and it's an autobiography, basically. Um, but mainly it's about surfing, uh, which I really try to make interesting to people who have no interest in the subject. Um, which may describe a number of you, others not so much. Um, but memoir is, is a weird genre for a reporter. Um, and you end up investigating your own memories, you know, kind of reporting out your own past. Um, and of course you're not the only interested party. Um, this is private life we're talking about. And, uh, 
nothing was on the record. Uh, and now you're giving yourself license to depict, uh, you know, friends and loved ones and, and all these unguarded shared moments, um, usually many years later. That's a big irrigation. You, know, you need to think long and hard about what to put in and, and what to leave out. Also, it turns out that, that some of your most vivid memories are completely mistaken. Um, you know, they're full of myth and erasure, and all that has to be corrected. Um, when I was a kid, we had an expression, this sort of comeback um, that, that we use when, when adults would sort of you know, take us to task. You know, what the hell were you doing? Well, why were you in Tijuana? Hey, um, I was researching my autobiography. <laughs> um, and, and it turned out to be partly true. Um, and for this book, I, I ended up contacting a lot of you know, long lost friends and, and frenemies. Uh, you know, and in some cases, found that their recollections were wildly different from mine. Um, a lot of subjects that I feared might be really difficult, you know, sort of painfully sensitive. Um, turned out in some cases to be, you know, happy memories. I, there's um, one old woman, I thought, oh, this is not, I don't know how to break this to her, but I described your life in here as one long middle-aged orgy. And I said, like, yes! <laughs> <laughs> um, it's true, it's in your book, and I said, yeah. Yeah, I'm just like 89 now. <laughs> just happy to have that out there. Um, and uh, in other cases, you know, people were, were appalled by like perfectly reputable episodes from from the past that that, that, that were being published. Um, and uh, so, you know, more negotiations, more soul searching, more research. Uh, and there's no chance that everybody depicted in, in the, this book or. In, memoir is going to be happy with their depiction. Um, this book actually had a weird genesis. Um, I was living in San Francisco, freelancing, um, and I sent a short political piece to the New Yorker, and it was the first thing I sent them, and they took it, just sent it over the transom, and they took it. And somebody in the editor's office said, that this is a good time to you know, propose a longer piece. Um, and I thought, okay, yeah, I feel like I had to do it immediately. Like, than half an hour. Mm -hmm. I didn't have any ideas. Um, <clears throat> so I said, uh, how about a profile of this guy I was then surfing with in, at Ocean Beach in San Francisco? Um, and, uh, and it was just, it was kind of, he was this, uh, I don't know if you know John McPhee's work, but he was like this John McPhee hero, sort of vintage McPhee. He was this charismatic outdoorsman. He's a physician and a big wave surfer, and larger than life person. And, and um, so they said, sure, I mean, I, I got the assignment from the editor. And, um, and then, because I had to write it, you know, I'm not John McPhee, I couldn't really do it. I, I was, it took me seven years to write. Um, <laughs> just a couple of deadlines. Um, and I find, I had all these kind of inhibitions about publishing this thing. I mean, I, I, but then I was writing, I was really doing a lot of, I joined the staff at the New Yorker and I was writing a lot of political opinion columns as well as reporting. and I. Didn't really want to come out of the closet as a surfer in the middle of all this kind of policy debate. <laughs> People are just gonna what you know? <laughs> some dumb surfer. We don't have to listen to you. Like, <laughs> uh, which didn't happen. I mean, nobody cared. Nobody, that, that was one of the worries that didn't um, uh, have a basis. Others did. Um, but it, when that piece came out, finally, um, it, it got a lot of reaction, um, and um, and my publisher then said. We should do this as a book. It was a huge, like, two-part, forty-thousand-word piece, and and, uh, and I had more material. And let's just do this as a book. You know, it's, it's, it's people are waiting. For, you know, read, want to read about this. And I didn't want to do it as a book, um, partly because the main character hated it and I didn't want to rub his face in it anymore. Um, and uh, but also, I found myself explaining to my publisher that. It, you know, this is just this one place where I surfed, Ocean Beach, and this one guy I surfed with. I've surfed more interesting places with other people. I'd much rather, you know, try to, and, and the more I told her about it, she said, good, write that book, you know. And I so, so, sort of backed into it. It wasn't an idea. I had, I had a lot of journals to draw on, but I never thought I would write a book like this or 
about surfing. Certainly, I, I really didn't take surfing seriously at all. I just did it all the time, but it was a kind of bad habit or an addiction, <laughs> I think somebody said. Um, and, and I wasn't proud of it and didn't really want to think about it, um, why I did it and all that. But as I said, I sort of backed into it. Then it took me another 20 years to finish, so um, not a rush job. Um, some people have asked me about the, the title, Bar Barbarian Days, um, usually before they read it, not after. It's because it's kind of an overarching metaphor in the book, um, which is partly a story about um, the, the struggle to become a, a grown-up responsible citizen and, and equally the struggle against responsibility, this kind of uh, essential threat. And in my sort of bipolar life, uh, uh, the North Pole of irresponsibility has very much been surfing. You know, it's this kind of nature worship, um, rejection of duty and, and productivity and it was kind of devotion to strange gods. Um, and I admire barbarians in principle, you know, kind of abhor empire in principle. But, but the other pole for me is, is, is citizenship, you know, also in, in sort of ancient sense of the word. Um, I want to participate in, in society, be productive, be useful, um, which in my case means right, and have opinions, and inform my readers. Um, but I spent a huge amount of time chasing waves, um, more than 50 years now. Uh, very intense sort of surfing life with all these complicated people and, and places, by which I mean waves. Um, and and you know, this book's really an attempt to account for that. Um, so I'm interested in what you're interested in, um, but let me read you a little bit from the book and, and then we can you know, talk. Um, this is a, from the middle of the book. Um, after a, uh, I'm in the middle of a long um, surf trip. I mean, so long it doesn't even. It was nearly four years um, after graduate school. I'd gone um, looking for waves in the southern hemisphere with a friend, Brian De Salvatore, um, also a surfer and also a writer. And um, and this is the point. We've been in the South Pacific for a long time, and, and uh, this is when we land in Australia. Um, Brian and I had landed in a beach town called Cura in Queensland, near the New South Wales border. We were the proud owners of a 1964 Falcon station wagon, this is in the late 70s, um, bought near Brisbane for $300, and had car camped and surfed up and down the east coast from Sydney to Noosa. It was dazzling to be back in the west, with all its comforts and conveniences, and to be surfing known spots. There were even road signs, surfing beach. It was great to have wheels, food and gas were cheap. Still, we were nearly broke. And so we rented with our last funds a moldy bungalow at the back of a ramshackle complex, misnamed the Bonnie View Flats. Most of our neighbors were unemployed Thursday Islanders, Melanesians from the Torres Strait up near Papua New Guinea, and some of them possibly had views. We didn't. But the beach was just across the road, and we hadn't chosen Kira randomly. The place had a legendary wave, and the southern summer was starting up, and with it, we hoped, northeast cyclone swells. Brian got a job as a chef at a Mexican restaurant in Culagata, the next town south. He told the owners he was half Mexican, but fumbled it when they asked his name. He said McKnight when he meant to say Rodriguez. He didn't have a valid work visa under any name. They hired him anyway. I found a couple of back-breaking jobs, including ditch digging, which deserves its reputation as the worst sort of donkey work. <laughs> then I got hired as a pot washer in a restaurant at the Twin Town Services Club, a big casino just over the New South Wales border, 15 minutes walk from our place. I told them my name was Fitzpatrick. The manager said that as a condition of employment, I had to shave my beard, and so I did. When Brian came home that night, he took one look at me and shrieked. He looked genuinely distressed. He said it looked like half my face had been burned off. I was pale where the beard had been, dark brown everywhere else. There, there, I said, it'll grow back. Um, you need to sort of know that for, I hadn't shaved for you know, the better part of a year, and, um, and he complained and complained the whole time um, in the South Pacific, you know, I had the horrible patchy sort of mothy beard, and 
and he'd say, oh, it looks really good, Bill, you know, he's like a really liberal priest. You know. <laughs> shame, 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 I never did. And, you know. There, there, I said, it'll grow back. I blew my first wages on surfboards. Kira's on the Gold Coast, a surfing center, and there were cheap used boards everywhere. I bought two, including a 6'3 hot buttered squash tail that turned on a dime, and when necessary, went outlandishly fast. It was a sports car of a surfboard and a nice change after months of riding my sturdy travel board. Brian also got new, much smaller boards and the surfing stuff. In the meantime, I was falling hard for Australia. The country had never interested me. From a distance, it always seemed terminally bland. Up close, though, it was a nation of Weisenheimers, smart-mouthed diggers with no respect for authority. The other pot washers at the casino, for instance, they called us Dixie Bashers were a weirdly proud crew. In a big restaurant kitchen, we were at the bottom of the job ladder, below the dishwashers, who were all women. We peeled potatoes, handled the garbage, did the nastiest scrubbing, and hosed down the greasy floors with hot water at the end of the night. And yet we made an excellent wage. I could save more than half my earnings. And as employees, we had entree to the casino's private member's bar, which was on the top floor of the building. We would troop up there after work, tired and ripe, and throw back pints among what passed for high rollers on the Gold Coast. Once or twice, my, co my co-workers spotted the owner of the casino in there. They called him a rich bastard, and he, properly chagrined to be rich, bought the next shop. <laughs> I had never seen the dignity of labor upheld so doubtily. Australia was easily the most democratic country I'd encountered. Uh, skipping ahead a little bit. The casino threw a fancy staff pre-Christmas party giving me the chance to re relive the painful part of high school that I'd managed, sorry, that I'd missed by being a hippie surfer who would sooner have gone to jail than to the prom. All the young women in the kitchen, waitresses, dishwashers, pastry chefs, were excited about the party. I could hear them giddily reviewing their dresses, dates, hairdos, the band, their after-party plans. I found that I very much wanted to go, perhaps even with a pretty waitress on my arm. But I didn't own a long sleeve shirt let alone the tuxedo that I gathered was de rigueur. More to the point, it was clear that to these girls I didn't exist. Their swains were all local bravos whom they'd probably gone to high school with. I spent the night at the party in my tiny, grotty bungalow, grotty bungalow room, trying to work on my novel. How I hated being a foreigner, always on the outside. The intensity of my shame and self-loathing self was unsettling. Brian and I wanted to write an article for Trax, a surf mag published in Sydney. Trax was nothing like its glossy, clean-cut American cousins. It was a newsprint tabloid. Editorially, it was rude, witty, aggro. It actually seemed to be the main Aussie youth mag, like Rolling Stone in its U.S. heyday. Huge bundles of it appeared at the newsstands every two weeks. Our notion was to make fun of the domestication of surfing in Australia. Trax and its readers already hated Americans. When being polite, they called us sepos, short for septic tanks, <laughs> rhyming slang for yanks. More commonly, we were just dickheads. We figured we could rile them. The editors invited us to have a go. The target was almost too easy. Surfing was fully mainstreamed in Australia. All the clubs and contests and school teams and well-marked surfing beaches, complete with car parks and hot showers. Culturally, it was screamingly lame. Brian and I had grown up in Southern California, where most beach towns and beach cops loathed and harassed surfers. That would have been in the 60s. Uh, my high school would have expelled us before they supported us. Surfers were bad boys, outlaws, rebels. We were, that is to say, cool. Surfing wasn't some tamed, authority-approved sport. Brian and I figured we could play up that stuff for tracks. The hard part was the writing. Neither of us had ever co-written anything, and our assumption that we shared a sensibility proved wildly wrong. We agreed on the idea for the piece, but Brian couldn't stand my drafts, and I despised his. Why was I being so ordinary, so predictable? Why was he being so purple, so over the top? When, when was he going to grow up? Was I aspiring to mediocrity? I didn't want my name on the self-admiring juvenilia he was producing, etc. I got so mad, I crumpled up the pages we were arguing over and threw the paper ball at him. He later said he nearly punched me before storming out instead. We'd known each other for eight years at that point, 
and our flat, fierce disagreement over virtually every line of this ditty for tracks made me wonder when our literary differences had become so pronounced. When we first met in Lahaina, what drew us together was discovering we loved the same books. In fact, the first words I ever spoke to Brian were, what are you doing with that book? He was crossing a post office parking lot with Ulysses in hand, and the familiar prongs of the big U on the Random House paperback cover had caught my eye. We stood there in the sun talking about Joyce and then the Beats for an hour or two, and it seemed, it seemed inevitable that we'd meet again. Our tastes had never been exactly the same. I was a more dedicated Joyce fan. He had an eye for genre fiction, including westerns, that I liked. I liked Pynchon. Brian thought his prose awful, and so on. But why did every sentence he wrote about Aussie surfing annoy me, and vice versa? We were headed in different directions, clearly. I had started as a teenage lyric surrealist, language drunk a la Dylan Thomas, and had been slowly trying to sober up. I was now more interested in transparency and accuracy, less enamored of showy originality. Brian remained enchanted by the music of words, what he once called the incredible foot-stomping joy of a well-turned phrase. He loved pure captured dialect, cracked vernacular humor, vivid, physica vivid physicality, and a knockout metaphor, and he disliked nothing more than a lazy stock expression. I voted to abandon the article, or at least to have it carry only his byline. But Brian was determined that it should have both of our names on it. So we dialed back his stuff to the point where I could agree to sign it. We used our real names, which was lucky, because the piece caused an unexpected stir. Peter the Palm, that was a British surfer that I worked with. Peter the Palm, who knew us only by our fake work names, actually asked me if I had read it. Some local guys were seriously irritated, he said, by all the exuberant insults from these American wankers. <laughs> Brian and I quietly decided to deny authorship if pressed. <laughs> we hoped to piss off readers. We did not want to get hounded off the Gold Coast. Tracks traditionally published wonderful, abusive letters, and we got ours. I liked, I wouldn't spit on you mongrels if you were on fire. <laughs> Brian liked, May your earlobes turn to assholes and shit on your shoulders. <laughs> I met a woman, Sue. She told me I was as mad as a two-bob watch. She meant it as a compliment. I liked her enormously. She was a big-mouthed, bosomy, bright-eyed mother of three. Her husband, a local rock musician and heroin addict, was in jail. We lived in fear of his release. Sue and her kids lived in a high-rise beach town called talk about mainstreaming, surfer's paradise. Sue was a bon vivant. She loved avant-garde music, art, comedy, Australian history, and all things aboriginal. She knew lots of Gold Coast gossip, which cokehead surf star shopped his mates to the cops, which cokehead surf star was rooting his sponsor's wife. She also knew the beautiful eucalyptus forested highlands behind the coast, where cattle grazed and kangaroos bounded and scruffy back to the landers lived in a cannabis-soaked version of the aboriginal dream time. We passed days up there when the surf was flat. Sue's kids, who ranged in age from eight to 14, made me a great jokey collage with cute koalas skeptically surveying the strutting of Gold Coast flaneurs. Then I got a midnight phone call. The husband had been released. Sue had received a heads up bundled the kids into her rattle trap car and was already hundreds of miles from Surfer's Paradise. Off like a bride's nightie, she said. <laughs> Off like a bucket of shrimp on a hot day. She sounded chipper, all things considered. They were en route to her mother's place in Melbourne, more than a thousand miles away. She would catch me on the flip side. I should watch out for her husband. Um, maybe a little surfing stuff. You know? I got a different job as a, as a barman in a rowdy sort of rock and roll club pub place. Um, uh, after work, I would walk down the beach road back to Kira, grateful for the silence, stopping at the top of the point where the great wave was said to break, peering into the sloshing blackness beyond the base of the jetty. All the Gold Coast waves we'd surfed so far had been sweet, warm, soft, a little sloppy. People said Kira, when it broke, was a rocket-fueled point break with crazy, hammering power. That was hard to picture. The first cyclone swell hit the day after Christmas. Kira woke up. The hard to picture became the can't look anywhere else. But the wave was a strange, ungainly beast, nothing like a California point break. Large amounts of sandy water were rushing around the end of the jetty, forming a torrent down the coast. 
It was overcast and glary that first morning, the ocean surface gray and brown and blinding silver. The sets looked smaller than they were, seeming to drift almost aimlessly onto the bar outside the jetty, then suddenly standing up taller and thicker than they should have, hiccuping and finally unloading in a ferocious series of connectable sections, some of the waves going square with power. The lip threw out that far when it broke. It was hard to believe this wave was breaking on a sand bottom. I'd never seen anything like it. The crowd was bad at dawn and rapidly getting worse. We got amongst it, as the Aussies say. I probably caught three waves that day. Nobody would give me an inch. The downcoast current turned the whole place into a paddling contest. Nobody spoke. The paddling was too grueling, and the least pause or inattention meant yardage lost. I was in good shape, but the top locals were in obscenely good shape, and this was what they lived for. Near the top, near the takeoff, the current got even stronger. As the set approached, you had to sprint upriver at a precise, not obvious angle, somehow putting just enough distance between yourself and the flailing, growling pack so that you were the one person in the pit as the water dredged off the bar, and then swerving, and with the last few hard strokes, catching the wave before it pitched. Then, assuming you stuck the takeoff, you had to surf it, speed pumping like crazy on one of the fastest waves in the world. It was a lot like work. If you made a wave, though, it felt worth it. It felt worth anything. This, I thought, was a wave I could get serious about. Maybe just one little tiny last thing about that, <laughs> that wave. Not, not all the surfing stuff, but... Brian and I had the advantage of living about as close to Cura as it was possible to live, unless you lived at the Cura Hotel, which had no room for the bar. Um, I checked the jetty every night on my walk home from work, and if there was any hint of a swell, we would hit it before first light. It turned out to be a great surf season, one of the best in memory, people said, with at least one solid swell virtually every week <coughs> in January and February. One cyclone, Carrie, smashed through the Solomon Islands and then seemed to drift around the Coral Sea for weeks, pumping out powerful northeast swell. Our early morning go-outs were often fruitful, yielding fresh waves with, for an hour or two, relatively few people. There was a regular pre-dawn crew, not all of them especially hot surfers. There was a gawky, friendly, bearded guy who rode a big wave gun, hardly turning at all, and who always yelled as he jumped to his feet and said his line, I got a lady doctor. <laughs> I happen to know the next line to that song. She cured a pain for free, <laughs> and she did. <laughs> Tell me what you're interested in. Any questions? Did you get wet today? I did start this morning, yeah. In fact, I got salt water dripping out of my nose. <laughs> Good south well, steamer lane, Santa Cruz. Where do you go out here with, with uh, beach? Um, well, I, I was in Santa Cruz this morning and, oh, and uh, served this place called steamer lane, well known. Crowded wave. Yes? So, it, did you write that article about Doc Hazard? I did. Yes, okay. Well, so I was one of the founders of Colonial, uh -huh. and so RCA Beach uh -huh. is a great, I'm a terrible longboard surfer and I can't deal with crowds, mm -hmm. but if you walk down the side of Commonwealth, mm -hmm. there's quite, it's great, great Good longboard spot, yeah. Yeah, well, it's good, any board. Mm -hmm. I can do short if there's anybody around. Mm -hmm. But I have another <coughs> question. Yes. As a pretty serious criminal justice researcher and a sportswoman. Mm -hmm. How did you, it sounds like your book explores how you put the two sides of your self together. Mm -hmm. Is that accurate? That mm, yes. That's part of the exploration? Yeah, I and mean, there's not a lot about my work, but it's all sort of informed, they cross informed one another throughout, yeah. I mean, I sort of reported the book and I, it's a sort of the story of my life, so I go from being a, a surf bum to being a staff writer at the New Yorker and 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 reporting for a living and, and all that, becoming I as I said a sort of citizen um, while <laughs> struggling against it at the same time. So yeah, it's it's um, but but not I, I mean some reviewers have complained, oh well wanted to wanted to read more about his, his you know career, his work life. But of course I'm gonna churn out articles and even books and one can read those that's you know um, Yes. Do you ever have any encounters with sharks at all? Any of the places that you've been? Um, 
nothing significant. I just Good. saw a shark last week in New York, but uh, mm -hmm. just a little spinner shark. Um, nothing, no great whites. Yes? I haven't read the book, but I learned from a review that you went to high school in Hawaii, in Honolulu, I think? Middle, Middle school, school, yeah. Middle school, yeah. Um, personal curiosity, my father grew up in Honolulu. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts now about race relations then? I don't know what goes on there now. I, my sister lives there, so I'm, I'm back there. What about then? About your oh, experience. then. Well, um, I, there was an excerpt, actually, from this that ran in the New York last month um, that was really taken from that little section about going to middle school in Hawaii. Um, we moved there. I was in the eighth grade and, um, and was growing up in this very sort of white bread um, world in, in Southern California. And, and suddenly I was thrown into this highly kind of racialized environment on a lot of like ethnically based gangs and all that. Um, I had a lot of fights and, and uh, uh, the Howleys, the whites were a small minority in the school. Um, it was quite an eye opener and, and, um, and very intense and, um, and soon enough I, there was actually a little white gang who called themselves the in crowd, believe it or not. <laughs> And, uh, and they invited me to, to join, and I just jumped right in. You know, it was, um, people would have my back. And, and that was actually the end of my fighting career. I was like, I'll stop once I was in this little gang. And, um, and it was quite bad. Um, and, and yet, I somehow remember it fondly. I mean, I write about it in some detail, being what you now say was kind of badly bullied uh, before I got in with these other kids who were quite bad. They were really rough. These, white kids were not middle class kids. Um, and, um, and yet, I don't know at all. Um, and, then, and I also don't know, this excerpt that ran was, was fairly controversial in Hawaii. There was lots of it, and I got tons of mail. I'm still getting mail from this thing that ran a couple months ago. And, um, and, and there were columns and papers there. Oh, you know, he's like writing about this like this dirty local secret of how it actually is, all the violence among kids and all the, all the racial stuff. And I was a little surprised. I sort of thought I was writing about, the, about ancient history. And there's some, like I mentioned, this thing that everybody knew, a local kind of mythology thing called Kila Howley Day, um, that I sort of lived in fear of when I was 13. What, what day is that? You know, if I stayed home on Kila Howley Day. And, uh, and I never was able to find out. It doesn't really exist. It's just some, you know, um, urban legend. Um, but it was in the newspaper. There'll be an editorial in the paper against, you know, we shouldn't have a kill a holiday. So, <laughs> it's always like a known thing, right? But, oh, people, yeah, I can't believe you put this in a national magazine, you know, kill a holiday. It's a great embarrassment. And, um, so I don't really know. I go there a lot, and, and I even teach there sometimes, and yet I have no real sense of, and I thought, as I say, that that was ancient and everybody was, like, mellowed out and racially enlightened now, but maybe not. Um, maybe there's still lots of lots of tension. I mean, there's been there's a whole history of white supremacism in, in Hawaii and, and, and worse. I mean, I mean, a near genocide of Native people from Hawaii um, that um, is very dark and, and serious. Um, but um, but that's that's really changed. I mean, there's still some you know white privilege, of course, um, in the social structure there, but economically and politically not anymore in Hawaii. It's, it's all changed quite a lot. And um, so I don't know though. I feel like I don't know. I mean this reaction to my piece made me think, I don't know what's going on in Hawaii, even though I go there and you know, probably grew up there and, and uh, think about it. I don't understand it. My sister knows more. She's a doctor in a hospital there, right? And they did a lot of stuff. Where do yes. you surf in New York? Um oh um well depends where it's gonna be good. Um, mainly the south shore of Long Island and the north part of the Jersey shore. Um, but it's all kind of a, I don't know how we would have done it before computers, um, because we're a little <laughs> group of us in my neighborhood in Manhattan, they're always watching, you know, they you trying to do your work, but you've always got this, these surf cams, and, 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 you know, these detailed, detailed forecasts, the wind's gonna switch, maybe start to clock around about three o'clock, you know, and it's kind of small windows of good ways, mainly in the winter, um, and um, so the days are short and it's freezing. Um, so you need a really good wetsuit, um, but it gets quite good. I'm actually even be saying that. it gets so good I don't want people to know about it. Um, but it grab, it's uncrowded. I mean, it's freezing, so you need a really good wetsuit. <laughs> snow on the beach and all that. But those are the two main areas. It depends which way the wind's blowing.
Where we is go. that Ocean Grove by any chance? It just kind of sounds like it was that not really. Ocean Grove is in Jersey? Yeah. It's, it's actually further down. Oh. That's more than a, I can't That's do great. that in the morning. The Rockaways? Rockaways are, are close. You can actually go there by subway. Yeah, train. Um, but I don't um, surf there much because it's terrible. Um, that's yeah. Seaside Heights, right? It's Surf City, right? What do we mean? Um, yeah, they're yeah. good ways, but that's all again a little bit further than I normally oh. go. Yes. Uh, Jones Beach used to be good. Uh, oh yeah. Yeah, not, yeah, not, not, not yeah. great sandbars, but yeah, it's yeah. wide open. It's good. I'm talking <coughs> late sixty. Yes. <coughs> but anyway, what I wanted to say is that you how you describe I've only read about seventy pages, but um, when your friend Brian were discussing the two things you valued in writing and he valued mm -hmm. the beautiful sentences. Sentence. Yes. I think he would be very proud of your work. I think some of your senses are just exquisitely oh, beautiful. Oh, thanks. <laughs> You're a hell of a writer. <laughs> but what intrigued me about your time in Hawaii and writing the memoir is you were able to get the letters you wrote back to your friends in the main. Mm. What teenage kid keeps a letter from you? I know. And, and this was, I mean, I actually was a big letter writer in my youth. and. Mm. Um, my parents didn't keep my 40-page letters from the South Pacific. Oh, yeah, no, you know, they lost them. <laughs> and um, then girlfriend, ah, et cetera, et cetera. Lots of letters that I thought would be there when I came calling were not there. But this, my best friend in junior high, Dominic Master Polito, um, uh, who was not a bookish person at all, I, to my complete amazement, and. He didn't know I was working on this, um, and I was working kind of just sultrally on it. Um, but he just, out of nowhere, sent me this great bundle. I wrote him a letter every week for when I was 13, 14, was living there. You know, my best friend, and I just had to tell him about everything in Hawaii, and I was a little, you know, scribbler. And it was just an absolute treasure trove. I could not have written the, the 50 page opening chapter. It's, it's all from that, those letters. And, and some of them are really embarrassing, I mean, they're crazy. The, and I quote, you know, embarrassing stuff. I got my best friend in Hawaii, um, that first year I lived there, um, was a, a kid, really good surfer, a Hawaiian kid named Roddy Kalakakui. And when I wrote Dominic about him, oh, I'm surfing with this kid, Roddy, now he's so tan, he looks Negro, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And just so many ridiculous things. And yet, it's kind of primary raw material. I'm just lucky that he hung on him. I don't know. Did you ask him why? No, I haven't talked to him about it. I mean, I have talked to him about, um, I've done fact checking with him and um, uh, and gone over sensitive stuff that I really thought he would say no to. He's got four kids and um, drugs and stuff that I just thought he would say, uh uh. And he said, fine. And I'm proud of my father. Go ahead and talk about how my father was in a federal prison. And I did. Um, but. Um, but no, I, it just seemed you know, a miracle that he got out of those letters. And, and then also returned. It's not like I went to him and said, you know, I uh, almost forgot I'd written them. It was a long time ago. And, and some of them just came in a box and there were like 40 letters. Wow. So, yeah, Scott, yes. Um, I have a more like a craft question. Yes. Um, so you're writing about, and I ha I've read the excerpt, but I haven't read the book. Uh -huh. So you're writing about this wordless experience, really. Yes where form is constantly changing, yes, right? Yes. There's no real architecture there. And then it's a complete foreign language to those of us who don't live in the, that world. Surfing. Right? Surfing, yes. yeah. So how, how did you, I, I'm just wondering how, because I haven't read the book, sorry, but how you thought about the writing, about those, the, the writing of that landscape yeah. and all the technical yeah. stuff that those of us that don't yeah. surf don't know. I mean, did you think yeah. in terms of metaphor? Did you think in terms of... Yeah, somewhat, but, but sort of metaphors for the ocean and for surfing are almost, by definition, hackneyed. You know? <laughs> I mean, everybody's kind of metaphored it to death. Um, I mean, every other writer compares writing a wave to making love and on and on. Um, but um, I, well, the first, that long thing I did for the New Yorker was, you know, writing mm -hmm. for the general public about surfing. and, and so I had, and then, but I had sort of editors and copy editors and everybody leaning over my shoulder then saying, what's this, got to explain that. And, and that piece is incorporated into one chapter here. Um, but I found it really kind of clunky and corny, um, partly because of that but, and other stuff, the ways I was just sort of compelled by the magazine or my own sense of our readers of how to sort of get non, 
people who knew nothing about surfing into this subject. Um, and, um, and blessedly in this, I could sort of do it my way. Which was basically, I, mean, I, I did keep running um, manuscript past friends and family who don't surf, and it would say, I don't know what this means. And I would say, how can you possibly, you've known me, how can you not know what a set is or a channel or whatever? Yeah. I don't know, so you've got to tell me. And so I, I did, in the first chapter mainly, this Hawaii chapter, which has this kind of inherent drama of this Lally kid in this place, um, I put in all this, or not a glossary, but I technically explain how waves are formed and, and give a bunch of technical terms that are going to be scattered all through the book and, and define them. Um, but you have to be paying attention. I mean, I, I think a non-surfer dropping in the middle of this book will be lost, certainly in the surfing scenes. Um, you need to read from the beginning, and then you've got to remember what you, what you read. Um, and then I hope it's all there. Um, and some, I don't think any reviewers have complained that they were lost in the surfing scenes. Some kind of, you know, like amateur reviewers on Amazon or something said, what, you know, how am I supposed to know what all this means? Well, but from here, it's, just, it's supposed to be there. Um, that, that's the and and yeah, there actually are some some. Um, I hope they're not strained, but some pretty extravagant metaphors, truly, in the ocean. But more um, just the actual um, very specific and often kind of weird thoughts you have, um, like I described. I know the New York Times reviewer pulled this out. Um, uh, a session with Brian and, and, and this, at this uh, spot, this reef break in Fiji we found off an uninhabited island where we camped, it was an amazing wave. And, and, it, um, and how it, it, we eventually were just kind of silenced by the, the wave and the situation. And, and we were trading off these you know, swollen paperbacks as we bummed around camping through the South Pacific. And, and I was reading at the time a biography of Hitler, like some crummy biography, which he'd also read. And, and I was out, we were out one day, and I was just seeing these long, long German words and sort of Gothic script sort of written in the scroll work of the, of the, the wind riffles on the faces of these waves. And I said, yeah, I'm seeing Oberkommando and Arbeiter Partey. And he goes, yeah, yeah, Molotov, Ripley, Trop, I see it. <laughs> and, and, um, so that's not got the metaphor because that was actually what it was like, at, you know, in that place at that moment. So that, you know, so, so as I said, a review will pull that out and say, you really, I mean, not what you think of. You see beautiful tropical waves. You don't see, oh, I have a lot of German words written on. Them. But in this situation, yes, and it makes them jump off the page. You hope that, yes. I, uh, I read your New Yorker piece back in '92. Uh huh. I remember telling my dad, "What a great piece! This will be a, this will be a book someday soon." Yeah, soon. And 23 years. And so I, when he came out, I read it just last week. That was amazing. Oh. Um, awesome book. Um, Thanks. I got a couple of questions for you. Who would you write it for? Do you have a reader in mind? Was there a family member for yourself? Was it a who's your perverts? No, nobody so specific, but definitely the general reader. You know, not hardcore surfers. Um, who um, I also don't want to bore and not bore and annoy with a lot of um, explanation, but. Um, I don't know. It, it, it went through many drafts, as you can imagine, 23 years. Um, and, um, and the last few drafts were, were it had a kind of quite a masculine um, intent. Um, I wanted to write about a series of men in my life and, and, and these places. And it was quite a stylized idea I first had. And that slowly broke down around the edges. In fact, a, a, a girlfriend of mine like just took over this chapter and became the main character. That wasn't my plan at all. Um, uh, like the fourth chapter, um, she just was so much more compelling than any of the guys I was surfing with or anything. And, and so the, that thing sort of broke down. And, and in the later drafts, I was more and more aware of women as readers and how I was being just too tight-lipped and, and and in some cases even nasty about love and relationships and some of the women in my life and that kind of stuff. And so my ideas were changing. And I first had this. A, a model that, that really didn't suit me or the material, but but I was pursuing a, a very um, sort of male idea, a kind of macho idea, um, and that changed a lot. Um, was there another question? Yeah, I, I hadn't asked it, but the uh, I was struck um, by the part of, about you know you and Brian and on your trip, and it's a really strong section. It's funny, really funny, complicated. Um, 
very um, so smart. It's just a beautiful part of the book. Oh, thank you. I was struck by how, how different it is in tone from the end of the book. I mean, it's also also great, but it's very different. It's almost like you've grown up, you've got a girl, you got a little girl, you got a, you know, baby, yeah. you got a yeah. you're a citizen. Yeah. But there's a, the, the flavor of the book is very different. Yeah, yeah, it does change. <laughs> well, um, um, the editor of the book recently said, you, you know what this book is about, don't you? No, I don't. What is it about? <laughs> um, and, and she said, it's about the, the sort of evolution and, and maturing of your friendships. Um, you know, you look at the early ones of Brian and other sort of big friendships earlier in my life. Surfing, I, I should add, really, uh, from in my life, the very vivid friendships kind of form around it um, that really last. And I mean, and even, you know, in late middle age, like now I've got this friend in New York that we're just, you know, kind of, we surf together all the time and, and we just talk surf when we're not surfing and we're always making plans. And, and somebody, I mean, that doesn't happen in ordinary life all that much. So you make really intense friendships as, as you get older. Um, and um, and she said, look how much you used to like fuck with each other in this friendship and that friendship and drive each other nuts and, and, and the boundaries. You didn't know how to, to deal with each other ultimately without making each other unhappy. And, and she's right. And, and there's a kind of steady progression, which, which was tr it's true in life pretty much, but it's very clear in this. In the last couple, I think I go to Madeira with, um, um, we're quite close friends, but we really don't make each other unhappy at all. And, and the same, same with this guy in New York, this ballet dancer or, or nice Broadway dancer, John Selye, that I've you know, served with now and profile in the end. It's, so in that sense, it's less intense. You know, it's, it's not guys who kind of can't stay away from each other and can't keep, you can't leave each other alone. It's, 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 it's a more mature, more <laughs> kind of boring, perhaps, type of friendship to read about. Yes? I, built, I was the guy that lived on Kulamana. That, oh yes, hi. That, that was a year yes. out of you at yes, MK. Yes. Unfortunately, I didn't change anything in your woodshop experience. Uh, <laughs> but no. I, w I was curious in your book. You only had one reference, as I recall, in Maui with sharks. Mm -hmm. And I sh I served five years in Hawaii, mm -hmm. and was constantly looking over my shoulder. Mm -hmm. Maybe it started in woodshop, but mm -hmm. but the sharks are always something you thought about, mm -hmm. given their size. But also too, given your accomplishment, you know, and the places you've served and the mm -hmm. and uh, the people you surfed with, other than that one competition you had off of at the cliffs, uh -huh. off of Diamond Head, I didn't see any reference in terms of you surfing competitively, and no, that I was really starting in the late 60s, you know. Yeah, it was, I didn't surf competitively, and like the, this one little contest I write about, which was really little, um, uh, my friend Roddy, I thought he would win for sure, the boys division, and, um, but he didn't show up and his brother Glenn was a judge because he was too old to be an artist and um, uh, and so time went on and I there was surf clubs and contests but but things changed um, the shortboard revolution occurred about two years later everything changed in the surfing um, in 1967 68 and um, and then the whole idea of being in a club contest all that went away for me and a lot of other people. The ideal became this kind of isolation and this purity and remote, this, this, this sort of scratched out frontier. That's, I mean, where we would live as like latter day barbarians is, was the idea. We were just enough, you know, we were turning our back on, on anything organized. Whereas Glenn, um, who was kind of my hero, this older brother, this, uh, was my idol when I was young, yeah, really, really good server, he became a competitor. Um, joined a club, was on a, what, a kind of uh, proto, a, a rudimentary pro circuit of the time, traveled all over the world. Um, and whereas Roddy, who was an even better surfer, my age never competed, and to this day has never competed. So some people didn't, some didn't. Um, and, and if you decided you wanted to make a living from surfing, you had to, obviously. And, and so Glenn did, and made a living for a while, I guess. I mean, he was kind of an iconic figure, more than a successful competitor. He had a really beautiful style, but didn't have the discipline to win contests or anything. So, I just didn't, wasn't good enough really. <laughs> yes. I, you can back I just, there, yes. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, I, I heard about your book on NPR, and what really piqued my interest, what you were talking about, is the finding this wave in Fiji, which I assume was cloud break. No, it wasn't cloud break. Oh. Um, <laughs> close. Um, if you're interested, I can tell you. Um, yeah. The, um, 
cloud break is a famous way um, in Fiji, but um, what we found is something they now call restaurants. Um, All right. well, unfortunately, right. um, I mean the unfortunate name, but um, mm -hmm. that's a way it breaks right on an island. We know the place, right. perhaps. Um, yeah. This uh, island where we camped has this great, great wave that wraps from the south, big south swells from high latitudes, and wraps around maybe like 180 degrees into the trade winds and just um, has this incredible tapering, um, wailing wall. But um, cloud break is nearby, it's on an open ocean reef, a um, mile or two south of there. And um, what became of that island, it's, this story is in the book, um, it, it, we thought it was like this place that would never be known or discovered. We were absolutely, you know, <laughs> silent about it. But we didn't, Brian and I never spoke the name of the island to each other. Years. <laughs> never spoke the name. <laughs> we had a little wow. nickname. We just used to call it Dakine, which in Hawaii is, means like whatchamacallit, you know, the kind of this thing. Um, Dakine, you know, and then that's, we were so intent on keeping it secret. Well, the secret, somebody, there were some other guys in it, but a couple guys served it before us. The people served it with us um, off yachts. And, and anyway, the secret got out, and, it and these American surfers came and leased the island and, and built a resort. Yeah. And, and, that, and one day after the surf magazine, our little secret paradise was, was um, splashed all over the pages, and, and people started going to this resort. And the only way they were able to make that resort work was because they found cloud break, which is much not as, as immaculate a wave, um, but much less fickle, much more consistent, bigger, sort of open ocean waves, often waves that you need a boat to get out there. And that's really how that resort became very, very successful. You know, we got rich and, um, and it became quite a thing in surfing, you know, it was expensive. And, um, and, and the island wave could not have supported this, the kind of carriage trade, the weekly turnover of guests that they did. It's just a small resort, but the turnover and really um, great waves which they had exclusive access to. Um, they organized with the government that they could like chase off anybody who tried to surf these two, both spots. Um, and I say it would only work because cloud is more consistent, well, which was just horrendous. Yeah, politically completely indefensible. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> at a certain point, I was so dying to go back there and surf that I swallowed my principles and, and, and <laughs> became a paying guest and then became a kind of fanatical guest, like ready to you know, mortgage my house um, to surf there as much as I could. And I really fell in love with Cloud Lake, actually, um, which is a more consistent, bigger way that just, I just loved. And um, that wasn't the one we found. We, didn't, we never saw it out there. Oh, you could see. perhaps have you know, climbed a tree with binoculars and said maybe there's something, you know, but we would never have known from the island. Well, I, I recognize that yeah. about that, and that's what piqued yeah. my interest in the book, because now, with the advent of the computer, we know all these places, like, yeah. as well, like, most yeah. of the, every yeah. surfer's dream is, like, that perfect wave that yeah. nobody else knows about, yeah. which is, now that's kind of a myth, but... Yeah, yeah, it's, um, well, it's a little bit easier to, I mean, exploring, looking for waves is really a... Uh, a long-term um, sort of heartbreaker. Usually, you don't find much. And um, but with Google Earth, with computer, I mean, you have a much better chance now um, than before. Although a lot of people feel like there aren't that many left. Um, although a lot of islands in the Pacific, a lot of atolls. You need a boat, though. There's, you're not going to be able to like backpack it the way we were doing. Like this island that we found, and, and a lot of other places we found. Um, were not that inaccessible. You know, it might be an uninhabited island. It's only a few miles from a village, say. Um, there are places out in the middle of nowhere that get great waves and, and are really hard to get to or stay to stay at. Um, so it's it's yeah. And there's no such thing, though. I mean, it, people use that way. Well, I mean, per it was perfect. You know that word, um, <laughs> and which is a bad description of any wave or any. You know, waves are just these kind of violent. The end of, of a long chain of storm action, ocean reaction, they're not these objects and you know, they're not a diamond or a rose, something in nature. They're all there's always wind and tide and things <coughs> happening. And and that place, what they now call restaurants, top of the island, is as mechanical a wave as I've ever seen anywhere. And yet every single wave is different. Lots of them are troublesome in all kinds of different ways. There's no such thing as a perfect wave. Yes. Is there any kind of resolution between this barbarian and the <laughs> <laughs> um, Well, I try to like get out in the water and also uh, show up here. <laughs> um, and, um, and I'm trying to be a little less uh, 
stupid in the water, and, you know, and and then for that matter, my reporting, you know, um, got a child now and all that, mm -hmm. so it was kind of tamping down, I'd say. I mean, then then and then real regret when I do stupid things, and still doing some stupid things toward the end of the book. Mm -hmm. Yes. It, it looks like the San Francisco chapter, it sounds like what you said is kind of a rewrite the way you wanted it of the New Yorker piece. Yeah, the redone and for the book, yeah. It, it uh, ends with, uh, Doc hated that article. That's yeah. in 92. Has yeah. he not changed? He feels the same way about it now? I think changed? he probably still despises it, but um, <laughs> not with it. I mean, we're friendly. Um, not with the same passion that he felt at the time, um, I hope. Um, <laughs> he just. It's, it's hard to be written about, and he really didn't like it. Yes. So. Sorry. So, oh, no, okay, go ahead. so, so that guy is Mark Renneker, yeah. and you're, he he was a very important person in my life. He saved oh. my husband's life. Oh my God. And so, we called him Doc Hazard, and he uh -huh. had a term that I've been searching for since I first met him. Uh -huh. It was called Capitan, and he said that it was a term for an uprising, a completely unexpected uprising of water in the ocean that resulted in a wave. I would be so grateful. I mean, maybe he made it. You know, that's my memory, Clapitan, of what he said. Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard that phrase? And up welling of water in the ocean causing that a wave. Would, that would, unexpected, that would cause no, unfamiliar to me. Maybe that was his metaphor for cancer. Mm. Yeah, this, um, this, this fellow Mark is a cancer education specialist and um, a doctor and, and an amazing doctor. Amazing And um, who knows? Maybe he's talking about that. I mean, yeah, cancer of the ocean, I don't know where, where that um, analogy would go. Um, but but I thought maybe, it was a real surf term. No, I've never heard. Okay. Of it. Well, I've I've looked in. Yeah. No. I I I might actually ask him about the next time I talk to him. I've never heard such a thing. Such a beautiful. I mean, if it's a, indeed a word. Yeah. But the ocean doesn't get cancer. It doesn't Lapitan. work that way. Lapitan. The ocean doesn't work that way. Yeah. Yes. Please. Do you have a question yet? Yeah. This gentleman's question kind of fed into mine about the kind of surfing and citizenship <coughs> being on opposite ends. Do you find though that you need the blue mind, so to speak, of surfing in order to stay plugged in, especially when you write about some difficult things? Um, yeah, yeah. It, it's a, um, sometimes I'm actually quite conscious of that, you know. Um, the, a lot of reporting I do has been on quite dark subjects, you know, war and different kinds of conflict and um, terrible stuff and uh, just horrendous oppression and injustice and you know, I kind of wonder what's wrong with me and why I'm always writing about this kind of stuff. Um, and, and sometimes I've been quite conscious of, um, like for instance once in El Salvador in the Civil War there, a really terrible day, there were three journalists killed and one wounded. I was with one of the guys who was killed. It was just this horrendous day in the war. And after filing my story, um, usually I report and go back to New York and my story. It was a short piece, so I just filed from there. And I just went surfing. I was really messed up by this this bad day with this guy. And um, and just surfed and surfed and was really aware that I was trying to, you know, like just kind of get over it and stop crying about it and all that. And surfing was, was part of that. And there's been other stories too where it's like really direct, really obvious that the way to deal with that in part was to surf. Oh, this is why I surf. I wondered why I surf. <laughs> this, this seems to be important now. Yes? You know, you talk about the men in the story, uh -huh. and you work with pretty masculine men. Yeah. Yeah. The women, are there, if you surf the women, are there women in your life, are there women in the story? There's a, there are quite a few, I mean, maybe too many women um, in this story and sort of story of my life, but not um, surfers. Um, I think there are lots of female surfers now. Um, didn't used to be too many. And, um, but I, I've never really coincided in time and space with a serious female surfer. I mean, wouldn't have made the cut at all in this kind of story. Um, but I, and there were some women out this morning actually in Santa Cruz and uh, not really good surfers, but um, there are 
really, really good. I mean, I see video of women who just rip. I mean, they're better than 95% of men for sure. Um, and I'd love to see, because a lot of what goes on in surfing is this kind of. I'm just asking about your book. Where, where do women show up in your book? Uh, well, as I said, I had this, this girlfriend who just took over the, this chapter. I mean, she wasn't supposed to, but she did. <laughs> um, and, and then the book kind of changed, and I couldn't get it back to the, <laughs> my, my plan. Um, and so um, then other women in my life um, kind of shape and, and become main characters. Um, and, um, but none with any interest whatsoever in surfing, kind of the opposite. In fact, my wife has been um, just like supremely uninterested in surfing as long as I've known her. <laughs> um, in fact, once um, she, she's, from, she's from Zimbabwe, a landlocked country, just zero interest in the ocean. Um, and. Um, and really sort of making fun of us and all our nonsense, you know. Um, and, uh, but once, at the very place where I surfed today in Santa Cruz, um, Sumer Lane, Lighthouse Point, um, we were out there a long time ago, when we in San Francisco, and, and there you can kind of, especially when it's small, you sort of see people surf right underneath you, like from a pier, I mean, they're just going by a smaller wave right near the cliffs, and, and, um, and she kind of saw how more of what it is, you know, it wasn't just, because to her, waves are just these sort of two-dimensional objects in the distance. And, and yet suddenly you could see that they're three-dimensional and, and breaking in time and what it all is. And she's, this is like almost interesting, you know? That's <laughs> <laughs> as far as I ever got with her. <laughs> never got, she never took a picture of me. She's like, she just never even watched me surf. She'll just like sit there with her back turned while I'm <laughs> 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 Can you shoot the pier? I, I remember seeing Laird Hamilton do it in Santa Monica this year. Uh -huh. That's a sort of Laird Hamilton sort of thing to do. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, I think that we leave that to Laird. Okay. Yeah. It, that, there was actually when I was a little kid, and, and before shortboards came along, um, there was a sort of thing about that. Because, um, you know, going through the pier on the way, coming through and all that was, looks very dramatic, but it was never much um, respected among surfers. It was sort of more of a trick for the, okay. the girlfriend or something. <laughs> um, but Laird would be doing it to this day. That would be him. Um, yes, right. After your experience at Rice Bowl, yeah. how did you ever handle overhead size, uh, undertow current? I mean, yeah. to me, I mean, it, it just, you start out in Southern California, you yeah. start out cliffs, and, yeah. you know, you rarely get something overhead. Yeah. And then you move, you move yeah. uh, on the other side to, uh, to you know, Bowl, to yeah. uh, that area. And yeah. it, it's a completely different break. And, yeah. and I, I think that's where my uh, fear factor kicked yeah. in big time, because I said, this is not safe. Yeah, well, well that's true. It's not. Um, Rick okay. um, is asking about a you know a scene kind of early in the book. The first time I was really really scared, thought I'd drown if, if I didn't make it over some uh, waves, um, and they were just way out of my league. I knew I was out. I I knew I was quite sure that you know I, I that I'd drown if I was caught inside, and um, and those remained a kind of marker and a shame and I never found every instant of that that episode you know stayed with me unlike you know moments of joy or triumph you know just oh I'm so ashamed of my just uh, nothing bad happened I was just so terrified and, and like paddle a mile around to come in just uh, never would surf there again and that kind of stuff um, and that's uh, I don't know I've had far worse experiences since then where I actually did get caught and actually you know thought I might drown and um, uh, but that was just an early experience of the kind of terror you can you can have surfing, and it's definitely something you have to. Um, you're asking about sharks, and I actually never, I don't think, worried about sharks in, once in my life. Also, I mean, you know, some play. I've surfed some really really sharky places, um, you know, river mouth where agricultural you know, dead animals are floating through the lineup and, and that kind of stuff, and you know that, that that's a sharky spot. Um, but I just haven't. I don't know. Um, it doesn't, it preys on some people's minds, but, but not mine. And the most surfers I know don't ever talk about it or think about it. I've surfed with a guy actually once in Australia. Now I'm kind of rambling, but um, we'll wrap up shortly, I think. But um, uh, I surfed with a guy in Australia once who had been attacked by a great white, they call him a white pointer there, um, in the exact spot where we were surfing. And, um, and, and he told me the story of this horrendous you know, attack, really, really bad attack, but in the hospital for a long time. And, um, but obviously he survived, and here he was surfing the same spot again some years later. And um, I, that 
Kirk gave me the creeps, and, and he said, oh, you know, lightning never strikes twice, and, you know, <laughs> I'm perfectly safe, it's exactly what I'm talking about. Say I didn't feel, <laughs> yeah, that's you, maybe. But, um, uh, but that, that, that thing, the fear factor, as you called it, um, in surfing, quite, I don't even think of surfing as a sport. You know, what I'm after, and what other serious surfers I know are after, has nothing to do with competition, usually. I mean, there are pros who treat very much that sport and make a living at it and so on. But the vast majority of surfers aren't particularly interested in contests or competition or organized anything. I mean, the idea that surfing will be in the Olympics is just horrendous to me. And, and most of the <laughs> Let it not be popular, please. More, more organized. And it's just like corporations pushing that surfing. No, no stake in that. In fact, a, a stake against it. No interest in it. But um, what you're after is is this sort of experience of beauty. It's, it's not a lot to do with sport or competition. And, um, and, but it's a weird kind of thing to take up as a kid because if you get very into it, depending on where you live, I mean, some places are pretty mellow, Florida. Um, but in Hawaii, around here, the fear of drowning is, is well justified and you've got to really handle yourself and, and figure out what your limits are every step of the way, when you're 12, when you're 13, when you're 18, and it changes. And, and, and how do you know what your limits are, what you're, you know, so it's not like other sports. I mean, I don't think soccer players worry about dying each time they go out to <laughs> kick a ball around. Um, and uh, so that, that scene in Rice Bowl just kind of illustrate that part, which comes back in different form, sort of in middle age, where I think about it differently and, and, and actually take much um, stupider chances. I was just amazed at how many times in your book mm -hmm. you just surfed alone. I mean, you were out there in these overhead waves by yourself in new conditions, you know, Surfing alone, there's a kind of uh, idea that um, you know the buddies you should surf with somebody else um, because that's safer. I, every time I've ever been in trouble, there's you know your buddy, your uh, it doesn't matter other people. There's nobody can help you. I mean, because you're usually in a spot where nobody else wants to be, or, or I mean, you're in some terrible spot. Nobody's gonna paddle over there, or swim over there. It depends. I mean, there are situations where somebody can help you, but in general, it, surfing alone is the same as surfing. With, I mean, it's great in a way. I love surfing alone. Um, but then nobody, you don't get to show off, so there's that problem. <laughs> <laughs> I think maybe one more question. Yes. yes. How did Doc's game strike such a chord uh, with the New Yorker editors? Because uh, when, when I first read it, it was such a unique piece. Because uh, really, San Francisco is and surfing. Yeah. It's not a great surf spot, really. Right. Yeah. So far away from New York and yeah. the New Yorker. Yeah. But how did it all click and come together? Well, I think, I, I mentioned how the, the, this book's kind of weird genesis and um, in this off the top of my head proposal, but part of what caught his, I mean, you look for certain incongruities that make a story feel fresh, you know, man bites dog and all that. And, and so I said, oh, um, what about a profile of um, this big wave surfer in San Francisco, this kind of gritty, urban, big wave, what, and he's this brilliant doctor. What? None of these things go together. And so the answer is yes. That's how it gets assigned. Um, I mean, I had enough instinct. I was a freelancer then. I knew how to, you know, propose a story that might get assigned. Um, the other said that I had the problem having to write it. And, and that took all those years. But um, it, it just, that, but the, by the time I, seven years later, turned it in, um, that editor was long gone. <laughs> and, then, and the editor was saying, well, what's this? Who's, you know, why are you giving me this? Uh, it was assigned, you know, some years ago by your predecessor. And, um, <laughs> Uh, but he, I, he kind of liked it, um, and and recognized it might be of interest to somebody not to him at all. He was interested in ballet and women's handbags and just not <laughs> this at all. Um, he, in fact, some of the really corny stuff in there. He said, "Tell me more about Gidget." <laughs> <laughs> and so a little Potter history, including Gidget, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and but the stuff that was that made that piece, which it really is the magazine article that will not die. It's um, people bring it up um, to me still. I mean, now this book's out; it's a little different, I suppose. But I mean, even I mean, earlier this month I was in Mexico, and this happens to me. People will start to say, like, "Oh, you surf," and they'll start telling me about that piece, <laughs> and I'll say, "Oh, I wrote that." Man. They don't believe me. <laughs> and, and in fact, earlier this month in Mexico, some complete stranger in the water started, he was from San Francisco, started talking to me about that piece. And I said, oh, I wrote it. And he just 
paddle away. <laughs> <laughs> I seemed reasonable until I said that. In a way, he wrote it. That piece just has this life. I, don't, I didn't really particularly like it as I was trying to work it into this book. I kept thinking how bad it was. But somehow, it, some combination of things, it just got endlessly Xeroxed and passed around. And, and it's really nice. And, and, and probably leads some people to be interested in this book. Ah, this is that. But and a couple of reviewers have said, oh, then he plopped in that, that old piece. I did not plop it in. <laughs> um, it was the hardest chapter to write. There's 10 chapters here. And it's chapter 8. And the San Francisco was the hardest. There was a thing that was already written. The one that was already written. I swear I spent years trying to make it work in the book, trying to sand it down, trying to get the magazine-y stuff. And the, I mean, the obvious bad stuff was easy, but to actually make it organically take in this book. It's not a bad transplant, but actually something that works in the book. I, I still not done. I read it and think, ah, you know, there's things you could still do, but but I finally, I think we're done. Uh, you're done. Okay. Thank you.